Okay, all yours, Rachie. I don't think Rachie needs any introduction to us. I think pretty much everyone on the screen knows her. If you don't, you're in for a real treat. Oh, bless you. Thanks, Melanie. Well, good morning, everybody. And today we're looking at Luke 24, 13 to 35. And Michelle is going to read it to us in a minute. But I want you to enter into the story. And I always ask us to do this. Okay, I want us to immerse ourselves to let it soak in because I want Jesus on the journey that we find ourselves on, which is the road of struggle. It's the road of sorrow. It's a road of confusion and disappointment around the climate crisis. So I hope it also speaks to the rest of our lives because we're all going to be on an Emmaus road at some point. So Michelle, over to you. I will mute while she reads the passage. This action is taking place on Easter Sunday. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and they found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognised by them when he broke the bread. Thanks. Thanks, Michelle, so much. It's fantastic. So, the Easter Sunday stroll to Emmaus, the road of disappointment, chit-chat and sadness, the road of despair and failure. Then, broken bread and understanding and hope and focus and a 180 degree change of direction. Then a Sunday sprint back to Jerusalem. Now a road of hope and panting and no doubt sweat as they ran and jogged back over the seven miles. Same road, different people. Now, everything I say to you today, I say to myself, OK, I need to be reminded of the truth that Jesus is alive and well. And we need to be reminded as a group that Jesus knows exactly the state of our hearts and heads as we trudge along this road and that he's there alongside. So what is going on in their heads and hearts and how can this narrative help us? So let's have a look. So. 
two of Jesus's followers were walking away from Jerusalem to Emmaus, which if you Google the word Emmaus means warm well. And there are four villages or towns that could potentially be it. So on a wet Saturday afternoon in lockdown, go and Google it. It's interesting up to a point. Anyway, it was nice to walk together. I expect having someone to bounce their thoughts off and they were aiming for Emmaus, likely their home about seven miles from Jerusalem. We know one was clear past, Spelt differently, different place in the New Testament, but considered by most scholars to be the same person. They weren't part of the 12, but they were part of the Apostles Posse. And I think that sounds nice, the Apostles Posse. So it's strongly suggested by many scholars that this clear pass is with his wife, Mary. So that they'd be the parents of James, which is logical. So if so, OK, guys, this makes the passage even more interesting because we are told that she watched Jesus die and that she'd gone to the tomb before sunrise this same day. So check out um, chapter 24, because the plot thickens. So Emmaus being their hometown does seem logical. They're forbidden to travel on the Sabbath, we know that. So it's their first chance to get home after crucifixion. So if it is Mary, then she has run to the tomb before sunrise with some other women. She's met the angel. She ran and told the disciples, who said, and I paraphrase, nah, don't be stupid girls. And then it seems she believed them and not her own eyes because she started packing to go home. It's interesting, just as an aside here, how we can be put off and put down by other people and lose our focus. What on earth are you believing that for? So we, we unsee miracles and we unsee goodness in our own lives if we if dismiss them. Negativity spreads. That's just an interesting point on that. Anyhow, they're on the way together. They're talking about everything that had happened, everything. You bet that their heads and hearts were stuffed full. Of the past three years, their part in it, the way Jesus had lived, the way he taught in a joined up fashion, how he'd called them and how their hearts had sung and how they'd followed and how they'd given up other things to be part of the radical way of life. Then how he seemed to be it, you know, the actual one, because he healed the sick, he raised the dead, he challenged idolatry, he talked of God's love. And then, boy, the hardest bit, it was the week since Palm Sunday. So now I want you to imagine them talking, and I'm going to have to do this, the two of them. I'm going to shift my body across the screen. Here we go. Look, just seven days ago, okay, remember Jesus entering the Eastern Gate, the beautiful gate and the donkey? We know our scriptures clear past, don't we? Zechariah 9, right? Or did we get that wrong? There are bits in Ezekiel too, aren't there? That gate has always been to do with the Messiah. He could have entered into any of the number of 11 gates, but he did choose that gate. Yeah. Nehemiah gave the 11 gates all names. One was called the Dung Gate. It's no surprise he didn't go through that one. Anyway, joking aside, the donkey is a symbol of a ruler coming in peace, not taking over in violence. So that was also symbolic, wasn't it? The people loved it. I'm not imagining the crowds, am I? No, you're not. And the hazanas and the palms. No, it was amazing. It was so upside down. And the Roman leaders all these years have entered on white stallions and Jesus shows up on that donkey and he was saying, I'm him. Surely he was saying, I'm him. I don't think I've ever felt such hope. Hope for system change. Hope for a new start. Hope that God was going to finally step in and revolution would come at last and we would be free and have a future. Yeah, well, then the week that led him to hell itself, those charges, beatings, the trial, the cross, the blood, the death, and the end. And I saw it. I heard him cry out, Cleopas. I saw him die. I know he's dead. The soldier's spear confirmed that definitely dead. Yeah, what did it all mean? I don't know. I'm confused. To say I'm disappointed is a massive understatement. Even his body had gone. I was there this morning when I took the spices, and I don't understand. And the disciples told me I was being foolish. It's kind of embarrassing. We put everything into these past few years everything now what i can't wait to go home to be honest to leave it all behind only thing is then we have to face the whole village oh so they walked and they talked and they discussed and jesus would have taught them how to discuss because all good rabbis said you don't listen you discuss you wrestle you're not passive listeners you roll things around that's what they'd have been doing but they were also in shock we know that um Anybody here who has uh, traveled the, the road of grief and loss knows what our brains are trying to do. They're trying to assimilate and adjust. So we go round and round in that process. So what a shock for them, right? The end of everything, every plan they'd ever made now has a different ending. 
And as they were chewing these things over, Jesus came up and walked with them. And I think, well, I'm sure you love this bit. I do. So has he been trailing them or waiting behind a bush or just appeared? I mean, it doesn't matter and we don't know. But what does matter is this, that Jesus drew alongside and he fell in step. He fell in step with their struggles and their disappointment and their grief. And he drew alongside them literally. We have a savior who falls in step. I love this. He let them set the pace and he listens to their heads and their hearts. And he speaks to both. We're going to look at that in a minute. He hears their disappointment in him. They don't recognize him. I've always wondered about that. But then if you put the last view of Jesus into the frame, I think it makes total sense. They last saw him covered in blood, swollen, beaten, dead, looking pretty grim. And here was the risen Jesus. He was all cleaned up and, and ready to rock and roll it. So different from the last time. So unrecognizably different. The mind knows it saw him dead. The mind can't take that in. So Mary would still be trying to process the nobody in the tomb thing this morning. Ah. So to be honest, I think I'm exactly the same. I've been a Christian since I was a child and I still confuse his voice and I still don't recognize his presence. I'm sure you're probably the same. So we asked them, what are you chatting about? And I love this little line. It says they stood still. Now, when you walk along with somebody, walking is an activity you do side by side. When you want to talk about something really important, don't you just stand still on the pathway and face that person and say, well, da, 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 da. So they turned, they stood still and their faces were sad and Jesus clocks it all. How can you not know what's been going on? I mean, how out of touch are you? And I think I can be like this too, because when I speak to God about the planet, I catch myself th saying things in prayer like this. Don't you know how serious this is? Where are you? Where have you been through history? Don't you know how serious this is? And then Jesus does this thing. What things? He asks. Don't be mistaken. This is about getting ownership. What do you say has been happening? This is about their interpretations and the events are one thing. But when we are asked what's happened, we always give an eyewitness or a heart witness account. So we embellish things, okay? Memories are never the truth, but the truth as we see it. So we remember it and we embellish it as we go back through. So Jesus is actually asking this, what happened? Tell me about it. What is going on for you? How do you see and feel about it all? And I think we need Jesus to ask this of us, right? After every time we need read the news, see reports, hear the government speak, or see people suffer, or watch the destruction of our earth, and in our local context, not just the Amazon. So for example, HS2 is in my borough and Michelle's, and watching this causes so much anxiety as we go about our weekly and daily lives seeing the evidence. Maybe you live in Kent near the refugees. You're dealing with your daily thing. Jesus says, what is going on for you? Tell me about it. What's happening inside you? Tell me about it. What is going on for you? Tell me about the lack of sleep and your anxiety and your fear. How do you see and feel about it in your body? I see you eating more or less. I see you drinking more. I see you storing anxieties in your body and I see your tears. Tell me. Now, some people say this is a tongue in cheek from Jesus. So he's kind of being funny by saying what things, but I personally don't agree. Yes, God knows all about our yesterdays, todays and tomorrows. Jesus isn't pretending not to know, but it's his power and kindness to them as they need to get it out and they need to have a space to process it. They need to let out their muddled thoughts. Don't we all? Prayer, after all, is telling God what he already knows, but longs to hear. They refer to him as a prophet, only a prophet, notice. And they mention the women and the angels. And then in the midst of their answer, they say these brilliant giveaway words. We had hoped. And in coaching, one of the things we're trained to do is look and listen for the asides, the little throwaway linkers. And here it is. We had hoped and he goes straight for it <laughs> so this is a mother of all disappointment lines 
In case you think we can't or shouldn't be disappointed in God and express that, check out Jeremiah, I wish I'd never been born. Check out the Psalms and check out this passage to name three examples. So they say we'd hoped he'd been more than a prophet and would have rescued the whole of Israel and set us free and rule us and do stuff. We had hoped for more, faster, bigger, better. We had hoped along with all the disciples. We had hoped. And I think this line resonates with us, right? We had hoped in our individual lives, we'll come to the climate in a minute, we had hoped by now to be married or maybe still married or maybe happily married. We'd hoped to have a job, to have parents who unconditionally loved us or hoped for health or to have enough money or to have another day with a past loved one or to have better friends or to have a different church. We had hoped. And then we had hoped for our country and the world, surely things that Jesus would care about. Governments of integrity, far reaching justice, humanity to have acted quicker about the climate crisis. We had hoped we would not be running out of time. We had hoped for civil disobedience to match the crisis that we are in, more people on the streets. We'd hoped for vaccine. We'd hoped for a truly green recovery, for an end to crippling mental health that comes from the stress of, of, of this, for radical system change, for people and planet, not profit, for world peace and communication, for women to be in leadership, for black lives to really matter, for evil people not to prosper, for morality and humility in all leadership everywhere, and for a global church to be the radical body of Christ. Oh, we could go on. We had hoped. And Jesus hears the women were not believed. He hears the men went to check the women's account. But having not seen the angel, well, it can't mean he's alive, despite the body. I wonder if Jesus is saying in his head at this point, I had hoped. I had hoped that you'd have got it, that you'd have listened to the women, that if you'd have known your scriptures, that you'd have trusted me, that you'd had a little bit more patience and faith. I'd have hoped you'd have believed what the prophets actually said about me. And Jesus tells them they were fools, meaning lack of understanding. I wonder, just an aside, if it's the same word the male disciples have said to the women. Just a thought. You fools, you know the scriptures in your head. Will you now apply them? Then he does that brilliant trip through the Old Testament, doesn't he? He makes links um, that had been missed, going back to basics, understanding what and who the Messiah was going to be. Nice sermon, I expect. And I want to hear that on repeat. And he opened the scriptures and then he opened their eyes and then he opened their understanding in that order. And we know then that he urged them to stay. Good Middle Eastern hospitality. And then he curiously took over the role of host and he broke the bread. And then they, ta-da, they get it. And the minute they get it, Jesus disappears. Of course he does. And they jump up and they start back along the seven miles in the dark to Jerusalem. But if they're anything like me, they'd have grabbed the olives and the bread and the za'atar and they'd have scoffed it <laughs> as they grabbed their coats and retied their sandals. And they made it in the dark, despite um, dangers of traveling at night. But wild horses or wild donkeys wouldn't have kept them away. And then with the end point, they found the disciples and told them everything. So as the theologian Nadia Boltz Weber says, and I will read her paragraph in full. Maybe real hope is always something we are surprised by. We all want hope that doesn't disappoint, that isn't really just naive optimism. We want a hope that finds us living for something that is all at once preposterous and impossible and yet the most real and honest thing we know. That is to say we want God because a hope that does not disappoint comes from God who reaches into the graves that we dig ourselves and other people and again loves us back to life. Only a God who was born suffering can bring us any real hope of resurrection. And if ever given the choice of optimism or resurrection, I'd go for resurrection any day of the week. This is not a faith that produces optimism. It is a faith that produces a defiant hope that God is still writing the story and that despite darkness, a light shines and that God can redeem our mess and that despite every disappointing thing we have ever done, 
or that we have ever endured, there is no hell from which resurrection is impossible. The Christian faith is one that kicks at the darkness until it bleeds daylight. And I want to add that disappointment about Jesus himself can cause people to walk away for good. I've seen many friends walk away from him, and I'm sure you have too. And Jesus knew this danger. His cousin, John the Baptist, had a major, I had hoped, moment in prison. Check out Matthew 11, 6 later. I had hoped you were going to come through for me, Jesus. I'd hoped I'd be released. You're doing all these miracles out there. You're raising people and healing. I'd hoped you'd do that for me. I'm stuck in jail. I'd hope for peace and faith. But I have doubt that you even are who I thought you were. And I'm sure that if he knew what was coming, he'd have actually said, I'd hoped that I'd have kept my head. <laughs> to John, Jesus says this amazing line. I'll say it twice. Blessed is he who doesn't fall away because of me. Blessed is she who doesn't fall away because of me. Blessed are they who don't fall away because of me. So in other words, I'm not coming through for you, John, in the way you had hoped and expected and wanted, but hold firm. Don't let disappointment in me and my lack of action in the way you hoped, don't let that ever come between me and you. This is probably my favorite verse actually in the whole Bible because it acknowledges genuine disappointment in Jesus and what seems to be not going our way. Jesus says so to us in our day, now with the climate crisis, stand firm. Keep focused on me and don't let anything come between me and you. Because nothing, climate breakdown, climate emergency, nothing can or must separate us from the love of God.